welcome everybody to this video kindly sponsored by REC Watches. You might be thinking, why this sponsor track? Well, let me tell you a tale. Back in 1940, at the height of the Battle of Britain, Australian fighter pilot Patterson Clarence Hughes took Spitfire X-4009 up into the skies over southern England. This was a Mark 1A Spitfire, one of the very earliest models, and in the space of less than a month, he made ace three times, with 14 confirmed kills and three shared kills. He and his aircraft would be lost in September 1940, after his parachute failed to open when he bailed out. But subsequent to World War II, the wreck was rediscovered, excavated and transferred to the Hunter Fighter Collection based in Australia where it's currently undergoing restoration to fully flyable condition. The damage to the crash meant that some of the surviving aluminium of the aircraft has to be replaced, but instead of going to waste, that's been incorporated into a series of three X4009 watches by REC, in grey, midnight blue, and black. If you use the link in the video description below and the discount code DRAC, you'll be able to get yourself one of these watches with a nice discount and of course support the restoration of a piece of history, as a portion of each sale goes towards the further restoration of the aircraft. Thanks again to REC Watches, and now on with the rest of the video. After wrapping up the series on the American interwar fleet exercises aka the fleet problems, quite a number of you asked about other Navy's fleet exercises, you know, what were the Japanese doing? What were the British doing? Etc. Etc. Well, unfortunately, neither of the British nor Japanese records are quite as complete as the American fleet problems. In the Japanese case, because of their habit of setting things on fire in 1945 to deny information to the Allies, it wasn't completely successful, but it does make patching together what they were doing a little bit more difficult. And in the British case, Fire is also a major problem, although in this case it wasn't willful, it was thanks to a certain Hermann Goering and hence Luftwaffe buddies who managed to blow up and set fire to a bunch of Royal Navy records, which includes some of the records of their exercises in the interwar period. Fortunately, they didn't get all of them, and some of the others can be reconstructed partially from various accounts of officers who served and backup copies of records because whilst the central archives are obviously rather key to all this multiple copies of various evaluation documents were printed and some of them actually you know weren't discarded so by the time people realized well you know that fleet exercise 20 years ago that we lost all the main records for oh yeah i've got a copy of that somewhere in my bookcase was a typical conversation you might have in the late 1940s if indeed anybody cared anyway Today, we're going to start off looking at some of the Royal Navy fleet exercises. Because of the scattered nature of the records, and as I said, because some of them were actually lost, it's not going to be a comprehensive year-by-year -year account the way that we had with the American fleet problems, but we are going to look at some where the records are the most complete. But one thing that you might notice very quickly is that unlike the US fleet problems where the entire exercise was looking at an overarching problem, which was then broken down into individual components, all of which was decided well ahead of time, which was then sent out to the combined forces of the US fleet, which then carried out the exercise. In the Royal Navy's case, whilst they did have big whole fleet exercises in the way that the fleet problems did, they also used individual fleets to conduct large exercises to investigate specific problems and issues, and sometimes the outcomes of these exercises could be controversial or interesting enough that they were then taken offline and that specific battle might be refought on land in the offices of various departments in the form of te literal tabletop war games. And so today we're going to start off looking at the exercises and operations conducted by the Royal Navy in 1929. We're not going to be able to cover all of them in this one video, but if this is interesting enough to everybody, we can continue it in the same way that we continued the American Fleet Problem exercises, rounding out 1929 and then looking at some of the later ones. One of the other things that you'll discover if you start looking at the original documents for this is that the Royal Navy has a habit of being a little 
bit all over the place when it comes to just how much information they record. So, for example, Exercises and Operations for 1929 runs to about 120 pages covering the main fleet exercises. There are additional documents covering the tabletop war games and some later in the year smaller fleet exercises, but the main document covers 120 pages. Whereas in the late 1930s, the documentation covering a single exercise runs into something like 500 pages. So, yeah, that gives you some idea of what's to come. In any case, in 1929, the main fleet exercises at the beginning of the year consisted of six. These were codenamed MA, MZ, M1, OA, OD, and OC. They took place between January and May 1929. MA was the January 1929 exercise with the Atlantic fleet only. MZ, M1 and OA all took place over the space of a week in March, which were combined exercises between the Mediterranean and Atlantic fleet, so most closely resembling a US Navy fleet problem. And then OD and OC took place in June and May 1929, and these were solely done by the Mediterranean fleet. Now, the volume that details these exercises and operations also includes a small section on a torpedo exercise done by Australian destroyers titled Single Ship Torpedo Practice. And obviously, if we continue this series, that will be covered in one of the subsequent videos. Now, what exactly were these exercises? Well, the torpedo exercise, pretty self-explanatory. But there are brief summaries of the objectives of each exercise included in the document. So exercise MA was an exercise designed to gain experience in the attack and defense of a large troop convoy and to investigate the speed requirements for shadowing submarines. And that was conducted by the Atlantic Fleet. Exercise MZ, which was one of the combined fleet exercises, was a strategical exercise embodying an attempt by a weaker fleet to intercept and destroy a portion of a superior enemy fleet which is detached from the main fleet for convoy protection. Exercise M1, again combined exercise, investigated the coordination required when several aircraft carriers are working together, the aircraft being operated in accordance with their duties in action as laid down in the battle instructions and manoeuvring orders. Exercise OA, the last of the combined exercises of the year, was an exercise designed to investigate the situation when two battle fleets meet, one composed of battleships only and the other with an equal number of heavy ships, a proportion of which are battle cruisers. And then the two Mediterranean fleet exercises, OD, an exercise embodying the protection of a convoy of slow ships, their attackers, including submarines, consisting of a weaker force but possessing superior speed, and exercise OC, an exercise to investigate the tactical use of anti-submarine vessels in protecting an unhampered force against attack and shadowing by submarines of the proposed G class. And for those of you wondering what on earth they were talking about, the G-type submarine was eventually to become the river class submarines of the Royal Navy, which were absolutely massive early 1930s Royal Navy versions of fleet submarines. In fact, it was the Royal Navy's last attempt at a fleet submarine. Obviously, the US would continue the trend with things like the Gatos and so forth. But the rivers were actually even bigger. At 345 foot long, they were actually longer than the K-class. The only Royal Navy submarine, and indeed the only submarine on the Allied side, even up to and after the Second World War, that was larger, was X-1. So essentially, Exercise OC was looking at if there were five full-scale fleet submarines, i.e. submarines capable of keeping up with a battle fleet, could they, if they had been deployed from the battle fleet, attack an enemy fleet that was coming to fight the Royal Navy, but had a fully capable, at least as far as 1929 was concerned, anti-submarine screen. So that's a rather interesting concept going on, but... We will talk about that a little bit later. You'll also notice a running theme, which is very common throughout 1929, but also in other Royal Navy exercises, which is that they were very, very, very concerned with the defense of convoys from enemy surface raiders and submarines as well. But submarines were just included as part of the attacking force. 
in these exercises alongside the surface ships. In another difference with the fleet problems, whereas in the US Navy they tended to codify what was standing in for their own forces as blue, and then the enemy force would have a colour-based code name roughly referencing which nation they, or collection nations they were thinking that they were exercising against, in the Royal Navy the two sides were just red versus blue, and whether or not red or blue was the good or bad side, quote-unquote, pretty much just depended on the exercise. So we'll start off with exercise MA, which was held by the Atlantic Fleet between the 14th and 18th of January 1929, and was carried out during the Atlantic Fleet's progress from Portland to Arosa Bay. The purpose of the exercise was to determine how well the Red Forces could do in protecting the convoy, how well the Blue Forces could do in locating, shadowing, and then attacking the convoy, and thirdly, there was also an objective which was to investigate the speed requirements for submarines which would be shadowing the convoy, i.e. how fast did a submarine need to go to practically be able to hunt down merchant shipping. Now interestingly there wasn't a script to follow where the two sides would come together at a certain point. Instead, to quote paragraph 3 of the preliminary instructions, after the exercise commences, the Commanders-in-Chief, Red and Blue, will have a free hand to take such action as is necessary to achieve their objects, subject to any special instructions which have been received from the Admiralty. So, in other words, the convoy was heading from point A to point B, and outside of any special rules that would be communicated by the Admiralty, the Blue Fleet was entirely on its own in determining where on earth the Red Fleet had gone, and what they were going to do if dash when they found it. Which meant that in theory, a red force that completely evaded the blue force and wound up at Arosa Bay was a perfectly acceptable outcome to this exercise. Albeit that the Admiralty was being kept informed of the locations of both sides, so if that was about to happen, they could in theory redirect one or the other force to make sure that something would be learned other than blue was really bad at finding red. Because, as with the US fleet problems, a number of ships would have to stand in for other ships, the overall speeds of various ships were artificially limited, both to slightly prolong the exercise, but also to ensure that the proportional speeds of the different portions of the different fleets were actually, relatively speaking, the same. So the Red Force, that's the convoy and its protection, consisted of... Nelson and Rodney, which were limited to 14 knots, the battle cruisers Renown and Repulse, which were limited to 17 knots, the cruiser Vindictive, which was representing a county class, and the C class Cambrian, Comus, and Canterbury, which were standing in for York class cruisers, which of course at this point they didn't know that they were only ever, ever going to get two of them, and the cruisers were limited to 18 knots. There was the 6th Destroyer Flotilla, which was present and limited to 19 knots. And then there was the convoy itself, which was actually made up of the battleships Benbow, Marlborough, Emperor of India, and the carriers Argus and Furious, which together were collectively portraying 12 large transport ships and were limited to 11 knots. There were also some rescue tugs and some small local patrol craft consisting of a variety of small sloops and some submarines. A small aerial complement was provided by the flying boats of number 480 flight, which would fly from Portland. Meanwhile, the Blue Squadron consisted of the battlecruiser Hood, limited to 18 knots, the cruisers Adventure and Centaur, representing a county class and a York class respectively, which were limited to 19 knots, i.e. a large and a small 8-inch cruiser, the 5th Destroyer Flotilla, also limited to 19 knots, and then a whole load of submarines, L11, 12, 22, 25, 53, 54, 56, 69, and 71, all able to go at full speed, and the submarine M2, which in this particular case was acting as a mine layer, carrying an ostensible 100 mines. 
number 480 flight of flying boats on the red side was also cosplaying as an entire squadron and would be referred to as number 201 flying boat squadron during the exercise. It's also interesting in the footnotes to see that not only had the Royal Navy got some of its cruisers and some of its other ships portraying the larger vessels, but they were even very specific in terms of the destroyer capabilities that were to be simulated, noting that any flotilla leaders were to represent a Codrington-class flotilla leader, any V&W destroyers were designed to represent a Caster-class, i.e. the most modern destroyers that the Royal Navy had at the time, and with an allowance for Tyrion and Tetrarch, which were accompanying the 6th destroyer flotilla, to play themselves. A number of strict communication frequencies were allocated to both sides, but both force commanders were also allowed to use any other radio frequencies they wanted, as long as they weren't the four that had been assigned to the opposing side. And a specific frequency was set aside, that being 107 kilocycles per second, which was the general communication frequency that the Admiralty would use to communicate with all ships, and was also the emergency frequency if anything went wrong. So there were specific provisions in there that said that whilst both sides were perfectly happy to use direction finding against enemy signals that they intercepted, in most cases, no one was allowed to abuse the 107 kilocycle per second frequency in order to try and track down the enemy, because it was held that in real life, obviously, this communication frequency would not actually exist. Having learned something from the Battle of May Island, all ships were allowed to go into full darkening mode as if they were at war, with the exception of submarines and the anti-submarine flotilla, which, when they were on the surface in the case of the submarines, and generally in the case of the anti-submarine flotillas, were to have all lights running at all times. Submarine commanders were granted some dispensation to darken themselves if they were actually trying to attack an enemy position, but they were told that the commander would bear all the risks, bearing in mind any traffic, visibility, and other risk factors that were occurring. Torpedo firings by submarines were to be theoretical. There weren't actually to be torpedoes fired, even practice ones. And there was a specific and rather long list of instructions as to how to deal with submarines. These were informed by a large number of submarine accidents that had occurred in the early part of the 1920s and can essentially be summarised as submarines had to remain on the surface at night and although they ha would be running with their navigation lights, no one was allowed to shoot at them just because they'd spotted the navigation lights. They had to use normal wartime spotting procedures and assume that the lights wouldn't have been on. Submarines weren't supposed to get within 2,000 yards of any large ship. And in fact, if they did a simulated shoot at less than 2,500 yards, they'd be penalised. Destroyers and cruisers that were hunting subs, if they thought they had a contact, weren't supposed to get within 800 yards of the sub. And a submarine that thought it had completed a successful attack was to surface as soon as was practical and then signal to the attacking ships, this is what I reckon your course and speed are, this is what I fired, and that would allow the umpires to make a decision on how many torpedoes, if any, had hit. Obviously, the submarine was not held to actually have been spotted during this procedure. As there were a number of vessels already equipped with ASDIC, what we would now call sonar, there were also instructions on how to simulate an attack on a submarine, which was that an ASDIC vessel, if it found a submarine contact, was to keep that contact on its ASDIC system for half an hour and then fire three depth charges into the water. Obviously, if it was obeying the instructions, it would be well clear of the submarine. And then the submarine, when it heard the depth charges going off, would surface and remain out of action for an hour. That would simulate the kill of that particular submarine, but then the sub could go back into action and that would allow the simulation of multiple submarines attacking if indeed one of them was detected in the first place. Ships were also to keep records of how much fuel they expended and provide estimates of how much fuel they would have expended at full speed, which would allow the Admiralty to calculate what effect the various tactics and strategies put into place by both sides would have had on their actual fuel situation in wartime. And it was noted that the reduction in speed was in part specifically to allow the two sides to conduct multiple different attacks and defences, as they noted that this made the distance from Portland to Arosa Bay, which was actually 670 miles according to the course plotted, 
representative of a thousand mile journey. The Red Force, the convoy, was provided with a co course that they were supposed to roughly follow along with a series of cruising dispositions and screens which the Admiralty had designed and would like to see tested, although as we mentioned both sides did have a lot of operational freedom so if it turned out that these didn't work particularly well then the Red Admiral could change that. The objective of Blue was actually twofold. To quote specifically, the obje object of Blue Forces under your command is to give me, that's the Admiralty, early information of departure of Red Expeditionary Force and such of their subsequent movements and disposition as you consider necessary. Subject to the above, every endeavour should be made to damage the convoy by all means at your disposal. So essentially they were combining a convoy attack exercise with a potential reconnaissance in force against an enemy expeditionary force exercise. In response to this, the Admiral in charge of Blue Force split his fleet into three sections. The three groups designated Q, K and M each consisted of a large ship, Hood, and then Centaur and Adventure, the latter two obviously cosplaying larger ships, each accompanied by three destroyers, and they were ordered to establish a patrol line, and then if an enemy ship was sighted, sweep and try and find the convoy, and then shadow the convoy whilst the other groups came and joined them. In this effort, they were going to be aided by the submarines, which had been divided into Force P and Force S. Force P, held to be a group of faster subs, were to patrol as well, whilst Force S, held to be a group of slower submarines, were to establish a static cordon around Portland Bill, which was where the Red Force was going to be leaving from. Given the disparity of escorting forces, the Blue Admiral instructed that if Hood's group encountered the enemy, then where possible they'd try and nibble away at the escort cruisers and destroyers, whereas if the two cruiser-led groups encountered the enemy, they should only try and engage enemy destroyers that were a little bit out of position, although all forces might engage any target with torpedoes, the Blue Admiral was rather conscious of the fact that with a single capital ship and two cruisers to his name, he was heavily outgunned if he tried to crack the convoy itself. On the 14th and 15th, luck seemed to be mostly with the Blue Forces. On the 14th, the Red anti-submarine screen and flying boats had deployed to try and clear any potential submarine screens off of Portland, which indeed were there, but for the most part, outside of one submarine being spotted and temporarily knocked out, most of the time the submarines spotted the patrolling aircraft or incoming ships before they themselves were spotted and then just dived to avoid detection. The only exception to this was over the night of the 14th and 15th, the submarine M2 was detected wallowing close to the surface as it had been just under the surface and the sea conditions had caused her to breach. This meant that she was also knocked out temporarily. But since the majority of the static submarine screen was still intact, when the Red Forces deployed, they were able to spot and report the location, strength, course and speed of the Red Convoy, which in turn allowed the Blue Surface Force to sail with a good idea of where their targets were. It didn't quite go all their way though, just after darkness fell, the submarines from the static line all surfaced, and L-11, L-12, and L-69, which had been angling to try to attack the rear of the convoy, were spotted by the anti-submarine flotilla from the red convoy, which had dropped back just in case, and those three submarines were also knocked out temporarily. Over the night of the 15th and 16th, the faster submarines that were in the active sweep were ordered to maintain contact with the convoy as now the static line had been bypassed and they managed to successfully do so, albeit that L-22, which along with M-2 managed to spot and report elements of the convoy, was herself spotted, in this case by the Vindictive, but L-22 missed the signals from Vindictive telling her that she'd been spotted and so made her report and motored on away. As dawn broke on the 16th, the red convoy continued on its course, but the outer screen was repeatedly changing course to try and mislead any scouting enemies as to where exactly the convoy was going, as the screen was spread out enough that a theoretical submarine or destroyer on the horizon might spot the outer flanks of the screening force without actually being close enough to see the convoy itself. 
And so with the screen constantly maneuvering, it should in theory be harder to figure out where the convoy was actually headed. This had a limited degree of success. A number of submarines were spotted and forced to dive, and at one point L-11 tried to attack but was evaded. But the tactic of deploying the screen far out seemed to mostly bear fruit as whilst all the submarines in the mobile force as well as L-53 of the static force managed to keep contact with the Red Fleet throughout the day, only L-11 actually managed to sight and report the course of the convoy. However, their spotting reports were accurate enough that the three blue surface groups were able to close in, with the least capable of the groups, that being Centaur's group, representing a York-class cruiser and three destroyers, being ordered to approach the convoy from the west. Meanwhile, Hood, with her three destroyers and Adventure, simulating a county class, came in from the east. They did manage to sight the Red Screening Forces. Unfortunately, Hood's group ended up sighting Nelson, Rodney and a cruiser, which meant they were a little bit stymied in terms of actually getting at the convoy itself, which all added up to the fact that by the time the sun set on the 16th of January, it being about 4.30 in the afternoon, all three of the blue surface groups had actually come into contact with the Red Forces, but had so far been unable to sight the convoy itself as the distantly deployed screening ships were constantly driving them off. The one saving grace for the Blue Forces, apart from their speed, was that visibility was excellent, which made it very difficult for the slower Red Forces to actually get within gun range before the Blue Forces just withdrew slightly. Over on the western side of things, the Centaur group was having to deal with the fact that Vindictive, Renown and Repulse were chasing them. But the Red Forces proved a little bit too enthusiastic for their own good, as the Vindictive, which was off chasing the Centaur, left a gap in the screen through which the destroyer Warwick slipped through, managing to spot first the smoke of the convoy and then, about 20 minutes later, the convoy itself, shortly after which Renown and Repulse showed up and chased Warwick away. The destroyer Wallace tried to exploit a similar gap caused by the Cambrian chasing one of Hood's destroyers, the Vortigern, and came off a little bit worse for wear as she was spotted by Canterbury, Nelson and Rodney, and had to engage extreme evasive manoeuvres and use of smoke to escape the situation, although she was judged to have been slightly damaged by splinters, lost some speed, and had a gun knocked out by the umpires. This set up a series of night actions on the night of the 16th and 17th, over on the west side of the Red Forces, all three of Centaur's destroyers, Warwick, Vimy, and Whirlwind, were repeatedly engaged by the Red Screening Forces as they tried to get in close to the convoy, as the screens had now closed in for the night. Over on the east side of things, Versatile and Walker, both of Adventure's group, managed to keep in touch with the convoy and were minimally engaged, so it was a lot quieter on that side of things, whilst Adventure herself and Hood, along with her destroyers, hung back. During this period, contact had been effectively lost by pretty much all of the submarines, with the exception of L-12, which tried to make an attack, but was detected and driven off, the submarines then attempting, via orders from the Blue Admiral, to try and get ahead of the convoy to try again. Within the Red Forces, however, there was some confusion as to where exactly each ship should be in the screen, which resulted in Campbell and Wessex being engaged by Comus and Cambrian in a case of friendly fire. This led to the final day of the exercise, the 17th of January, which was quite exciting as everybody had set themselves up overnight to try and do the most damage or undertake the most protection, depending on which side you were on. Centaur had escaped being chased by Vindictive overnight and, along with its destroyers, tried to make an attack from the west. Centaur managed to get within sight of the convoy, but then Renown and Repulse showed up and drove her away. Adventure and her destroyers tried to attack the rear of the convoy, but were driven off by Canterbury and Cambrian, with two of the Adventure group destroyers, Walker and Whitley, judged to have sustained some damage. The destroyer Watchman wasn't quite as lucky, being caught by Cambrian and Canterbury and knocked out. The submarines, with the exception of L-25, had failed to get ahead of the convoy. L-25 did manage to force the Red Forces to detour to avoid her, but she was spotted and was unable to make an attack. 
As the Centaur group slipped aft to try and help the Adventure group attack the rear of the convoy, the Red Admiral sent Repulse to reinforce the Comus and Canterbury, as he was afraid that Comus and Canterbury on their own might now be overwhelmed. With the Red forces shifting their positions, Hood tried to get in and attack the convoy in one last effort at six o'clock in the evening. Unfortunately for Hood, she ran straight into Nelson and Rodney, who were waiting for her, and was forced to retire under a smokescreen. This pretty much marked the end of the exercise. The convoy had been shadowed and its position reported consistently throughout the entire exercise, but the blue forces had singularly failed to actually engage the convoy itself. They'd ended up with a number of their destroyers damaged, and at least three of the submarines were judged to have been sunk without having done any damage to the transports within the convoy itself. So overall, the Red Admiral, whilst not being able to transit all the way to his target without being spotted and shadowed, had managed to keep his forces together and largely undamaged, except for the number of friendly fire incidents, which did come in for a bit of criticism. Interestingly enough, apart from the persistence in shadowing, this rather accurately represented on a considerably larger scale what would happen in World War II when older battleships were assigned to convoy escorts and ships like the Panzerschiff or the Scharnhorst showed up. Essentially, as long as a much heavier screening force was able to maintain cover of a convoy, even if the opposition was faster, if they had less firepower available to them, it proved very difficult to actually get at the convoy itself. Apart from the friendly fire incidents, the main takeaway lesson noted for the Red Forces was that ideally more destroyers, or more escort light craft generally, would have been very useful, as it was considered that a number of enemy submarines could have been either sunk or forced under if they'd had enough destroyers to detach to go and actually hunt them rather than just fulfill the role of fleet screen or convoy screen in this case, which, whilst it had ensured that the submarines were unable to get at the convoy this time, had allowed the submarines to just drop out of range, dive, and come back and try again. For the attacking forces, it was noted that visibility had actually generally been pretty good, and if visibility was considerably worse, then given the damage that had been incurred by the blue forces, despite the fact they'd been mostly shadowing and spotting the convoy as opposed to attacking it, suggested that if they'd had to go somewhat closer to conduct this, they may well have actually been sunk. Interestingly enough, given what was to be exercised later on in the year, the feedback from the submarines was mostly concerned with the fact that they thought a much higher surface speed for their subs would be very, very important. As it was felt, this would have allowed them to get ahead of the convoy more successfully and more frequently, which would have allowed them to make multiple attack attempts. Whereas with their existing slightly slower surface speed, if they were spotted and driven off and or forced to dive, it could take a very long time for them to claw their way back into an attack position, if indeed they were able to do so at all. Due to the amount of underwater noise and underwater contacts made up of rocks, wrecks and shoals, etc. outside Portland, it was considered that a large number of coastal or harbour craft should be fitted with ASDIC to more heavily saturate areas outside of ports to enable submarines that might be lurking off of those ports to be detected and either driven off or sunk, as it was relatively clear that in the fairly difficult conditions, a single flotilla of destroyers just wasn't going to cut it. Although it was also noted that a rather unusual use of the ASDIC had been performed by HMS Campbell. During the night of the 16th and 17th, Campbell had used the hydrophone element of the ASDIC system to actually keep contact with a destroyer, the Vimy, which was being lost to view occasionally. This allowed them to actually keep track of Vimy at up ranges up to almost 3,000 yards and gave the guns and the fire control directors a good idea of where to be aiming when Vimy then popped back into sight again and could be much more quickly and more readily engaged. One element for concern on both sides, however, was the calculated fuel consumption for the destroyers, if they'd been operating at high speed, which would have left both the shadowing and screening destroyers with very little, if any, fuel left, and given that the distance travelled was not a transatlantic distance, 
it was noted that future destroyers would need to have significantly better endurance if they were to do convoy escort work that consisted of anything other than sticking very close to the convoys at low speeds. This sort of led into the first combined fleet exercise of the year on the 18th of March 1929, Exercise MZ. In this case, the Red Force consisted of eight battleships, which was actually four, Queen Elizabeth Resolution, Barham and Revenge, with each ship playing two. There were then three battle cruisers, Royal Oak, Ramillies and Royal Sovereign, which were pretending respectively to be Hood, Renown and Repulse. And in terms of speed, again, this was limited to allow a proportional speed to be gained. The battleships were limited to 11 to 12 knots, and the battlecruisers, or more accurately the R-Class standing in for them, were limited to 16. There were then seven cruisers, Frobisher, Danae, Cardiff, Ceres, Calliope, Caledon, and Cairo. Two aircraft carriers, Courageous and Eagle, and all of these were limited to about 15 to 16 knots, with the exception of the aircraft carriers, which could go faster than that when they were conducting flight operations. Then there were the 1st, 2nd, 3rd and 4th destroyer flotillas and the destroyer flotilla leader Douglas, also limited to 16 knots, and then a small cadre of submarines, L-16, 18, 21, 23 and 26, limited to 10 knots, and the sole K-class, K-26, limited to 12 knots. Two ships, Assistance and Sandhurst, which were simulating a convoy, were limited to 8. The Blue Force consisted of five battleships, Nelson, Rodney, Benbow, Emperor of India, and Marlborough, and these were limited to between 10 and 12 knots, so slightly sm slower on average than the battleships in red, but not by much. Then there were the three actual battlecruisers, Hood, Renown, and Repulse, which, like their imitations over in the Red Force, were limited to 16. Five cruisers, Vindictive, Comus, Cambrian, Canterbury, and Centaur, again 15 to 16 knot limitation, one mine layer, the Adventure, as well as two aircraft carriers, Argus and Furious, the former limited to 10 knots, the latter to 16 knots, with three destroyers in escort. The other destroyers were covered by the 5th and 6th flotillas, with Ls 53, 54, 56, 69 and 71 being the submarines. Rules of engagement were pretty much as with the previous exercise, with an additional element added, because now aircraft were involved, which was for the ships which were cosplaying other types of ships or other numbers of ships were instructed to place a white stripe across the deck in the vicinity of their identity letters so that an aircraft that spotted them could spot what they were actually supposed to represent. And similarly, if a ship which was representing multiple ships was knocked out of action, they had to hoist flag O at the yard arm nearest to the enemy when one of the ships they were representing was out of action, and a second O flag at the masthead when all the ships they represented were out of action, whereas ships that were just themselves and were knocked out of action had to fly flag O at the masthead by default. It was held that the fighting value of the Nelson class would be considered as one-third more powerful than a Queen Elizabeth, and the Iron Dukes would be considered one-third less powerful than a Queen Elizabeth in terms of their direct gunpower, and of course the Revengers and Queen Elizabeths were identical in that respect. In terms of durability, the carriers Furious, Courageous and Eagle were held to have the durability of a 6-inch cruiser, whilst Argus and Adventure were held to have the durability of a destroyer. If the convoy which was going to be involved was engaged, then for every 10 minutes that an enemy cruiser was under 10,000 yards from the convoy, the convoy would be assessed as losing two ships. A destroyer at the same distance would take out one ship of the convoy every 10 minutes. And if the convoy was engaged between 10 and 20,000 yards, then a destroyer would need 20 minutes before it could consider a ship in the convoy taken out and a cruiser would take out one ship every 10 minutes. The situation envisaged for this exercise was as follows. Red, whose naval forces were re represented by the Mediterranean fleet, was held to have been at war for some years with Blue, who were represented by the Atlantic fleet. As the exercise was taking place in the western Mediterranean, the Red territory was designated as Toulon, the French coast, Corsica, Sardinia and Galicia, whilst 
Blue Territory consisted of Menorca and the mainland from Cape San Antonio to a naval base which had been listed. Red was considered to have two important trade routes running from Galata along the African coast and from Galata to the Sardinian coast, running daily convoys on both routes. Blue had, up to this point, carried out sporadic raids on the Red Coast and on the trade routes, but due to Red's overall fleet superiority, been unable to achieve tangible results. The situation for the exercise was now, owing to Red's commitments in protecting the convoy routes and thus being forced to disperse their forces, Blue might be able to strike a blow at one or more of Red's isolated forces or at the convoys. In this scenario, with eight battleships versus five, three battle cruisers apiece, seven cruisers to five, and four destroyer flotillas to two, Red did have a superior fleet and had more torpedo bombers, fighters, and recon aircraft aboard their carriers, and some of Blue's battleships, along with Argus, were considerably slower than everybody else's craft. So Red was superior, but if they detached a significant force from their main fleet, they would lose that superiority. Red was told in advance of the exercise that there would be a raid on one of the convoys or troop transport routes by Blue, and that they have to give general protection to these routes during the passage of convoys and transports. Besides a heavy ship force which is normally used to cover these routes, they will be required to give special security to one particular route. Blue, ahead of the exercise, was told that certain forces are normally provided by Red for the protection of trade and transport routes, but they were unaware of the strength and disposition of these forces, or which of the two routes was particularly special to protect. Blue was also told that if they did conduct any raids on Red, then Red would receive information from an imaginary submarine line operating off of his port facilities. Based on that information, Red would supply protective forces using its main fleet. So essentially, Red had to protect its lines of communication and supply, whilst Blue was trying to raid one of those lines of communication, although it wasn't clear which one at the start of the exercise, and if possible, to isolate and destroy a portion of the Red Fleet by baiting it out onto one of those convoy routes. To make things a little less predictable and a little more random, there were a bunch of literal draws out of a hat to determine some of the particulars of the exercise. For Red, they had to draw whether a battle cruiser squadron, a division of four fast battleships or a division of four slow battleships, was to be the on-duty squadron providing cover to the various transport routes, and they drew the battle cruiser squadron. Now, that might seem to be a bad thing, considering that Blue have to try and intercept this, and obviously the battle cruisers are quite quick, but they also had to draw which trade route was the one they had to really protect. That turned out to be the troop transport route to Toulon. So that was where the battle cruisers would go. They also had to draw at what time they could leave their fleet base, the earliest time being 0100 on the 18th of March and the latest at 0500. Red got 0100, so they could leave nice and early. On the flip side, Blue had to draw which of the three routes they were raiding and they discovered that they were raiding the African convoy route, so they weren't going to go anywhere near Red's battle cruisers. And then on the 17th of March, just before they sailed, they were also given a telegram from the Blue government that said, situation behind the lines critical, all depends on big naval victory, any risks justified. Which meant they had to push very aggressively, and if they couldn't bring a portion of the enemy fleet to action during the day, then they would have to press on at night. Accordingly, the entirety of the Blue forces set sail in three distinct sections. The battle cruisers set sail with the second cruiser squadron, the carrier Furious and fifth destroyer flotilla, forming the fastest element of the fleet. Then second battle squadron, along with Centaur, Adventure and sixth destroyer flotilla, sailed and made up the middle speed portion of the fleet. And finally, the slower battleships in third battle squadron, along with Argus, sailed at the rear all heading for the African convoy route. Ahead of them went three submarines, L-56, 69 and 71, whilst L-54 and L-53 were on the Sardinian convoy route. Meanwhile, Red's battlecruiser squadron sailed with Frobisher, Danae, Keppel, Douglas and Courageous, the last of course being a carrier, to try and position themselves between the convoy routes to obtain recon from Courageous's aircraft, 
to determine their future actions. Both ships representing a convoy sailed and were escorted by a pair of destroyers each. A number of destroyers and submarines were dispatched in the direction of the Blue Fleet Base to determine if dash when they were moving. And finally, some submarines and destroyers conducted a number of sweep patrols. With all this done, the Red Battle Fleet deployed at 0100 at the start of the exercise, and the main exercise got underway. It didn't take very long for things to start happening. By dawn, the Whitley and Wallace, two destroyers scouting ahead of the Blue Battlecruiser Squadron, sighted smoke to the east, and the Walker, another destroyer, was sent to investigate. Walker encountered Keppel, which was a destroyer on the port wing screen of the Red Battlecruisers and the Carrier Courageous, and for the moment, since they were first heading to attack the convoy route, the Blue Battlecruisers altered course slightly to avoid being spotted by the enemy destroyers, whilst detaching Cambrian and Comus to protect Furious, and Vindictive and Canterbury were sent to investigate the reports of the enemy fleet screen. At the same time, L-56 and L-71 spotted the African convoy and signalled its location. Unfortunately, L-71 was spotted by one of the convoy, and based on this sighting, the Red Admiral concluded that an attack was definitely going to be made on the African convoy, but he thought it might be possible the other convoy was also going to be attacked, and so both convoys were ordered to turn around and come home, which L-56 spotted and radioed back. Meanwhile, overhead, both sides' carriers had sent up reconnaissance aircraft, ironically enough, five each, and the red aircraft fairly quickly spotted all of the blue major formations pretty much in the order that they'd sailed. Whilst almost simultaneously, the blue aircraft returned the favour, as well as spotting the African convoy, the one they were supposed to be targeting. By 0700, based on these reports, the blue admiral concluded a number of things. Firstly, the African convoy had turned back and it was probably completely useless to try and send forces to catch it, although the 5th Destroyer Flotilla did ask permission to try and attack it, but he also discerned that the Red Battlecruiser Squadron and Courageous were separate from the main fleet, and this was exactly the kind of opportunity he'd been looking for, and so the Blue Forces altered course to try and get between the Red Battlecruiser formation and the incoming Red Battle Fleet. This resulted in an escalating engagement, starting with Keppel and Walker firing on each other, which eventually wound up with the blue destroyers Walker and Whitley, along with the cruisers Vindictive, Canterbury and Centaur, the 6th Destroyer Flotilla and the Blue Battle Cruiser Squadron, becoming engaged with the red destroyers Keppel and Douglas, cruisers Frobisher and Dane, and the red Battle Cruiser Squadron, although this escalating engagement would take some time to develop. The Red Admiral, realising what was going on, also altered his course with the Red Main Fleet coming to try and assist the Red Battlecruiser Squadron. Both sides' nearest carriers also launched multiple airstrikes at 713. Six torpedo bombers from Courageous tried to attack the Blue Battlecruisers, whilst at 717 another six aircraft from Courageous went after Furious. A little miffed at this, Furious launched her own torpedo bombers, sending 12 aircraft after the Red Battlecruiser Squadron and a section of fighters to go and try and bomb Courageous. Back at sea level at 7.35, the two Battlecruiser Squadrons had started shooting at each other, and at 8 o'clock, the Blue Battlecruisers tried to alter course to lead the Red Battlecruisers towards the waiting arms of the Blue Battle Fleet. But the bait wasn't taken, and by ten past eight, fire had ceased, and the casualties from both the gunfire and the torpedo bomber attacks were assessed as follows. The Red Battle Cruiser Squadron had had its overall speed reduced to between 12 and 13 knots due to cumulative damage, and both Royal Oak and Royal Sovereign had lost a turret. Obviously, cosplaying Battle Cruisers, but either way, both ships were one turret down. Meanwhile, in the Blue Squadron, the actual battle cruisers, they'd fared a little bit better. Hood had one turret out of action and was also reduced to 13 knots, but Renown and Repulse, whilst reduced in speed slightly, were down to 16 and 15 knots respectively and still had all their armament functioning. Furious, though, had taken some hits from Courageous's torpedo aircraft and was reduced to 14 knots. Bearing in mind, obviously, that these speeds are relative to the speeds that they'd started out with in this exercise, 
and it wasn't suggested that this was the actual speed drop. So you're looking at light to medium damage with more of the damage being distributed on the Red Battlecruiser Squadron. The Red Battlecruiser's screening cruisers, Frobisher and Dane, along with the large destroyer Douglas, attempted to then locate the Blue Battlefleet to report back to Red Battlefleet where exactly it was and damage the cruiser Centaur, but in so doing, 2nd Battle Squadron managed to damage both Frobisher and Dane, leading to them being unable to open the range back up again due to the reduced speed thanks to battle damage, and so they decided to continue headlong and located the 3rd Battle Squadron as a result. Douglas, being slightly faster and more agile, was able to commence a shadowing operation on 3rd Battle Cruiser Squadron, but Frobisher and Dane continued to accumulate damage, with their speed dropping to about half of what they were originally allowed, before being knocked out of action and sunk around 10.30. The Blue Admiral now faced a bit of a difficult situation. After the skirmish, the Red Battle Cruisers were returning to their own battle fleet, and the speed differential wasn't enough to intercept them before they substantially managed to do so. The convoy that they were supposed to attack was also on its way home, and they knew that the Red Battle Fleet was out there somewhere. Therefore, to give them the best chance, it was decided to concentrate the three blue forces together as one homogenous fleet again, and they headed north to do so. Meanwhile, the commander of the Red Fleet knew that the Blue Fleet was being shadowed by the Douglas and aircraft from his carriers, and he decided that the best way to deal with this situation was to concentrate on the third battlecruiser squadron, the slowest of the ships, that being the Iron Duke class, and the theory went that if he was able to damage them enough to slow them even further, then either the Blue Battle Fleet would be forced to abandon them, and the slowed, already slow battleships would be easily overhauled and destroyed, or the Blue Fleet would be forced to stand and fight at a reduced speed. Therefore, both Courageous and Eagle were told to launch airstrikes at the 3rd Battle Squadron. These were duly launched, but the first aircraft to arrive seemed to have missed the memo a little bit, as 10 aircraft from Courageous went straight after Nelson and Rodney, which were part of the 2nd Battle Squadron. They did manage to score a couple of hits on Nelson and one on Rodney, with the overall speed of the squadron reduced to 11 knots, but as this was still a knot faster than 3rd Battle Squadron was capable of generally, this didn't actually fulfil the mission objectives all that well. The next six aircraft from Eagle did go after 3rd Battle Squadron and managed to score hits on Benbow and Marlborough, and then another eight torpedo bombers from Courageous also went after the correct targets, this time scoring hits on Benbow. And then lastly, four stragglers from Eagle again went up to 3rd Battle Squadron, this time getting Marlborough. As a result of these cumulative attacks, the speed of 3rd Battle Squadron was reduced to 8 knots, which then forced the Blue Battle Fleet to either reduce to that speed or leave them alone. Conversely, Furious managed to get another 9 torpedo bombers up, 6 of which went after Revenge, reducing her speed to 2 knots, and the other 3 went after Barham, but didn't score any hits. With Blue deciding to remain together, and thus having its speed reduced, the Red Battle Fleet began to close in, starting off with their cruisers, which began to skirmish with Blue's cruisers, and, as with the early part of the battle, the engagement started to escalate. Vindictive, on the Blue side, misjudged the distance, ended up under the guns of the Red Battle Cruiser Squadron, and was destroyed, whilst Canterbury, also on the blue side, tried to shadow the Red forces, but was engaged with long-range gunfire, and would also be sunk towards the end of the day. Blue submarines attempted to move to engage the Red surface forces, but whilst they managed to sight and report the locations of some of them, the aircraft and anti-submarine sections from the Red Battle Fleet were enough to allow Courageous and Eagle to turn away from submarines before the submarines could launch an attack, and eventually drive off and sink any blue submarines that showed up, until by 2100 that night, no blue submarines remained in contact with the Red Formation. The Red submarines tried to position themselves between the retreating blue ships and their port, but whilst they were relatively successful in spotting and reporting the location of the blue fleet, 
they were less successful at actually attacking, mostly thanks to aircraft from Blue's aircraft carriers. The last action before dusk was Argus. Argus actually lost an aircraft for real as it came down in the sea, and although the pilot was picked up by an accompanying destroyer, Argus herself moved in to salvage the aircraft, a ferry flycatcher, which was successful. Argus then rejoined the Blue Forces, but then trying to fly off more aircraft to locate and attack the submarines that were becoming more and more evident, she got a little bit too close to the Red Fleet and came under fire from the Red cruisers and destroyers and was assessed as likely sunk. As night fell, both battle fleets were in single lines ahead, and both fleets had sent substantial portions of their destroyers, and indeed in the case of Blue, all of their destroyers and all of their cruisers bar one, off to attack the other side in a night action. The first blow was by first destroyer flotilla serving the Red Fleet, which managed to get within a couple of miles of Nelson and Rodney, launching torpedoes and managing to score a hit on each, further reducing Nelson and Rodney's speeds. Shortly afterwards, the massed attack from the Blue Destroyer flotillas and cruisers set out to try and find the Red Battle Fleet, but this would take a little while. Simultaneously, the Blue Battle Fleet altered course to try and cut across the bow of Red Fleet and thus cross its T. Unfortunately, Blue had made a rather drastic error in estimating where the Red Battle Fleet actually was. They were saved in this respect when the extreme port wing of their searching force, the destroyer Valhalla, managed to run into the screen of the Red Fleet and engaged it, firing six torpedoes and reporting its findings, which allowed the other destroyers and cruisers of the Blue Force to adjust their trajectory. This also forced the Blue Fleet to alter course to try and maintain its attempts to come into contact with the Red Fleet. Fifth Destroyer Flotilla, part of the Blue Fleet, now managed to get into contact with the rear of the Red Battle Fleet and the aircraft carriers and tried to launch an attack, but the Red aircraft carriers simply turned away and steamed away from the incoming attack, and as a result, there were no casualties. There then followed a slightly embarrassing episode where 4th Destroyer Flotilla, which was on the Red team side, ended up attacking their own battle fleet with a spread of 48 torpedoes, despite some attempts from Caledon to warn them of the mistake they'd been about to make. But perhaps fortunately for the Red Battle Fleet, it was assessed that none of these torpedoes had actually hit, in large part because coming across the Red Battle Fleet and thinking it was the Blue Battle Fleet, 4th Destroyer Flotilla understandably found itself out of position to attack a fleet it hadn't been expecting to run into in this particular location, and had somewhat botched their attack. The friendly fire continued as Douglas, which had been dutifully shadowing the Blue Fleet, found herself sighted by the leading Red battleships as the two lines began to close, and the Red battleships knocked her out of action. As the two battle lines closed, 2nd Battle Squadron, that being Nelson and Rodney, used their torpedoes to open fire at Resolution and Barham. As you might have guessed from this, the ranges between the two fleets had dropped to fairly close ranges, 6,500 yards actually. Obviously, this being in an era before radar, visual spotting was required. Both sides really got stuck into it now, with general engagements between destroyer flotillas, cruisers, and the battle lines themselves all developing, with the ranges between the leading battleships closing to just over 4,000 yards before the umpires realised that perhaps the Atlantic and Mediterranean fleets had gone just a little bit too enthusiastic about all of this, and there was now a real danger of multiple collisions, and so at 2139 the exercise was concluded. Whilst everyone was quite impressed with the capabilities of carrier-based aerial reconnaissance, it was concluded that the quality of this recon was actually good enough that it wasn't worth trying to expend cruisers to confirm the results of aerial reconnaissance when enemy fleets were still considerable distances away from being engaged, pointing to the loss of Frobisher and Danae as a result of trying to do exactly this. It was also pointed out that whilst the torpedo strikes had been relatively effective in slowing down various enemy ships on both sides, there had been a degree of spreading of capability which had resulted in no individual ship being completely destroyed by torpedo bombers, 
and it was strongly suggested that instead of trying to hit anything and everything or retaining strike aircraft until the best target showed up, it was better to launch a strike as soon as you had a reasonably viable target and hit that target with everything you had, then pull the aircraft back and try again on another target later on if necessary. In the night action, bearing in mind again this is well before radar, it was estimated that Red Forces should have used somewhat fewer searchlights and that perhaps a single ship from each battle division should be allocated to use its searchlights to spot incoming destroyers and then all ships could engage based off of that as it was pointed out that the Blue Fleet had managed to lock on to the range of Red Fleet at 9,000 yards and hold that calculated firing control solution all the way down to 7,000 yards when they opened fire simply because so many of the red ships were burning all their searchlights trying to spot various incoming destroyers. The officers aboard Furious suggested that night time would have been a perfect time for them to launch further torpedo bomber strikes against the enemy fleet, but they hadn't been allowed to. The argument being that yes, Furious did need to light up itself a little for flying off operations, but given that at the, that time Furious had been well away from the battle lines and the battle lines had been shooting at each other, the chances of anyone actually engaging Furious at that point were slim to none. On a smaller scale, it was suggested that destroyers that had already fired their torpedoes should be the ones to use their searchlights to illuminate targets for other destroyers that had yet to launch their torpedoes, as of course a destroyer that had launched its torpedoes already was somewhat more expendable than one that might get in closer and launch an even more effective volley. There were also a lot of comments about the need to look further into night action, as at the time the battle instructions suggested that night action was to be avoided if the enemy battle fleet hadn't been defeated during the day, and yet in a reference to the 1928 exercises, it was pointed out that in both those exercises and these ones, the exercise had terminated with a general night action between fleets. Although a somewhat tongue-in-cheek remark was made by the commander-in-chief of the Atlantic fleet that the commander-in-chief of Red Fleet had exposed himself most gallantly and with great generosity to this night assault, and thus much valuable experience was gained by all units. Another item that was borne out by all parties was that there needed to be an independent system of casualty assessment and it was agreed that this was would be prepared in time for the next set of fleet exercises in 1930 as up until this point most of the damage to individual ships and casualties resulting therefrom had been assessed purely by the officers aboard each ship which had resulted in some rather inconsistent and rather interesting assessments of how much damage a ship had taken. And that wraps up a look at two of the exercises from 1929. Uh, let us know in the comments below if you'd like us to continue this on maybe a six-week to two-monthly basis, something akin to what we did with the US fleet programs. And if so, we can pick up again in a little bit with exercise M1. That's it for this video. Thanks for watching. If you have a comment or suggestion for a ship to review, let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to comment on the pinned post for dry dock questions.